Hey, you're listening to the Road to a Billion podcast. I'm your host, Stefan Georgia, and I'm glad to have you with me here today. The Road to a Billion is a call-in radio show style podcast where you can ask me questions about freelancing, copywriting, entrepreneurship, mindset, scaling funnels, relationships, money, and really pretty much anything. The reason for the name The Road to a Billion is twofold. One is because my copy will have generated a billion dollars in sales by the end of the year here, which is coming up. Uh, that's both for my own products and offers and businesses and those of my clients, and because I want to make a direct impact on the lives of a billion people over the next 10 years, whether that is uh, emotional, financial, spiritual, mental, what have you, physical, my carnivore diet, what's up, um, and so on. We'll start taking calls in about five minutes, which is really Q&As. All you got to do is just put your questions on the Q&A if you're here on the live webinar um, that we are doing, and um, then Ed Ray will go through and kind of uh, call them out and answer them and we'll answer people's questions and we'll go from there. Ed, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and say hello? Hey everyone, I'm Ed. I uh, help people who are running on Facebook and they get banned and, uh, you know, they get the Zuck hammer, the band hammer, and I uh, help them retrieve their assets and get back online without uh, really having to get worried about getting cucked by Zuck again. It's tight, you know, it's like, cuck me once. Shame on you. Cut me twice. Shame on me is what they always say. Exactly, bro. Yeah. Andy Jeff says he's also really, really ridiculously good looking. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Steel. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. Um, so yeah. Okay, cool. We'll take questions in a few minutes here. Um, I'm here. I'm just going to answer as many as I can. Um, no guests today because I was kind of lazy, but I got some cool guests coming up. Um, who do I have coming up? I have Josh Snow will be coming out before too long. We have from Snow T20. Josh, uh, I don't think I can pronounce his last name. I'm going to be able to do it before the show happens. He's coming up pretty soon. Um, I have Steve D. Sims, who was uh, connected to me by David Ryan, the one who always is saying that Ed Ray should smile more. Uh, I did not know a lot about Steve Sims, but he's awesome. You can look him up. I um, think his name of his book again. I'm not sure I'm going to mention it here. I'll put his link in. Um, his book is called blue fishing the art of making things happen yeah so guy's pretty tight if you haven't heard of him there's a really cool Forbes article that I'll, I'll share when I'm promoting that one but basically he is like a like a dream maker like for like the ultra wealthy and billionaires so like he's got like you know testimonials from like Elton John and Elon Musk and stuff like that and he's done stuff where clients like want to get married by the Pope in the Vatican he makes it happen or they dine under the statue of David in like the Sistine Chapel um and like kind of uh just all kinds of stuff like that like um gosh what else just pretty much like yeah they say going to the bottom of the ocean taking clients to do like a deep uh, like a, a submarine into like the titanic to explore it and he's worked with like everybody like pretty much any famous person you can imagine like he's made stuff happen for them so he's a super interesting person he's got a whole philosophy on how to like um get people to uh to say yes to stuff like big big things and make big things happen so Super stoked on him. Thank you, David, for, for the hookup on that. It'll be really interesting. Um, Josh Snow, like I mentioned, um, I've got AJ Roberts coming on pretty soon, who is a, like was the co-founder of uh, Kartra back in the day and now is uh, working with, um, I'm doing a bunch of different stuff, but basically like he helped uh, what's called Webinar Jam to go from like a uh, triple or quadruple the revenue was like that this year, get like 20 million plus in revenue brilliant dude uh craig clemens will be coming on in the second like probably quarter two of 2021 so it weighs out um but i am working on on booking a bunch of really dope guests i'm really excited about that um but then every now and then you'll just get stuck with me and ed ray and we'll just be here answering your questions just a little me and ed but i am pumped for all the future people we got coming um and with that being said ed i mean i don't have like a monologue i don't have anything cool i should i mean i can i can you know I can try. We can chat. We can just shoot the shit for a minute, or we can just go into questions. What do you think? What's going on in your life, Ed? Let's do that for a minute here. Damn. Okay. What do I? What do I start, dude? Also, sorry. There's construction in the background. They're, they're repairing the elevator, dude. Okay. So the elevator can take. So we have three. We have three elevators in this building. Right now, one of them is under. But basically, it's fucked for the next six weeks. So can't use it. Uh, and. We just uh, finished like, you know, the first of the month. So a lot of people moving in. So we basically had one elevator for the whole building. So to get in the elevator would be like 30, 45 minutes. Plus COVID rules where you can only have two people in the elevator at a time. Oh, so anyway. oh. yeah, that's not fun. <laughs> not fun for anyone. 
That's not fun. Um, well, that's really interesting. On my end, I went golfing yesterday. Wow. Good. Look, look, look at the, the difference. In... <laughs> that's amazing. That's fun. I got, I got a lot of shit today. I got calls. I'm working on business stuff. Which I'm doing my plan for 2021. Love it. Um, David Ryan, watch every wife as a guest. Yeah, for sure. Wild Laura is a guest sometime. Um, it's a good idea, David. David's always coming with the, the good, the good wisdom. I know. Chilling in Panama, just dropping, dropping bombs of wisdom. Um, I see people in Panama. I right? actually have, a, I actually have a lot to share. <laughs> it depends how much you want to go into it. Well, let's um, like one more, and then we'll, yeah. I mean, I want to go a little more, you know? Yeah. Okay, for sure. So, I mean, we can, we can do a monologue, but uh, I've uh, basically I got out of burnout and I'm fucking ready to rock and roll again. And I've really been tweaking my offer for my Facebook compliance program because I know it can sell way better than it currently is. Um, I did a deep dive on my marketing message as well as the core desires of the people I'm marketing to. So the way that I was marketing it before is uh, how to write high converting um, Facebook compliant copy. And like, that's cool, sure, okay. Um, and people bought, no doubt. Um, but what I realized is, so I realized that maybe 30, 40% of my buyers are copywriters who want to become offer or business owners. So they want to launch their own product or service on Facebook. And I was like, that's very interesting. Why is that? Uh, and then, so I'm in uh, Ron Lynch's marketing mercenary program and I was going deep into like five different avatars uh, that my product or service could help for my Facebook compliance program. And uh, I realized that that benefit alone, like that core idea only targets to that specific audience of people, which is the off people who want to become or launch on product on Facebook. Because if, if you're a copywriter, you want high paying clients like that. That's it basically. Right. Um, you want to prove people wrong. You want to, you know, show people that you're um, like legit, like, you know, you're not a loser because just because you quit your job or, you know, you don't want to have to go back to your job or, you know, something like that. And then for business owners, they don't give two fucks about Facebook compliance. They just want their business manager back. They just want to get back on Facebook. Right. <laughs> right. Seven. <laughs> so, um, and actually I'll, I'll say, talk about that in a second. Um, but I realized that I'm missing the mark on these two other, um, angles. So what I'm now doing is I have multiple different offers. So for uh, business opportunity, basically so for copywriters, I'm basically gonna market it as, I'm gonna show you how to get high paying clients by, and you know, stop getting overlooked by clients, uh, basically get charged an extra one to two K for every single sales letter that you write uh, without having to do really much anything extra. Um, also how to get paid a hundred bucks to write five sentences per, face, per Facebook ad. Um, it's like really like, that's really sexy, right? But I wasn't marketing it like that before because I do teach that in my program now. Um, that's one thing. And then the other thing is for the business owners, uh, I now have like three options. I'm going to have a thousand dollar option to say, hey, you know, buy my course. You, you can do it yourself. Uh, done with you would be, hey, um, you want a bit more hand holding? I will go through your, your copy, like all of it, and you get my course. So you can go through the course. You can take your time, but I'll be with, there with you. So if you want feedback on your sales letter, uh, I'll have some for you or your ads or whatever. So like, they'll get a few consultations. Um, and then the full 25 K package is me with my, my new business partners, uh, where basically we do completely done for you, where we go into people's, uh, accounts, uh, cause we have some connections inside of Facebook where we can find out exactly like the real reason why your stuff gets shut down that Facebook doesn't actually show you. And we can uh, pinpoint exactly what that issue is. And then my partners will basically completely make your uh, account, what's it called? Uh, basically ban proof in a sense. We're like, basically your, your, pers your personal government being like you as an individual in the eyes of the government is tied to your Facebook stuff, right? Uh, we basically show you like are able to help you cut that cord. So if anything happens to your, uh, your assets, you're completely safe. So like, if you're, if you keep getting a banned, there's a very good chance that you're, you will personally uh, get banned or blacklisted from Facebook. 
and you'll be able to advertise again. So we help prevent that. Uh, and if you've lost your, your business manager, um, we help you give you the exact chat script, exactly what to say to get your thing back. So that's, so we you get your business manager back. And uh, I also do done for you. I completely overhaul all your copy and everything to make a Facebook compliance. Um, so that's 25K. So that's like a, a new thing I'm doing, which I'm really, really excited about. Um, and I think that solves a huge need in the market that few people are even talking about and are yeah. even able to solve. I, mean, I like the 25K package because I think that's super alluring. I mean, like for, you know, Laura's got some cool stuff going on right now, but like if that doesn't work out, it's saying red, like, you know, we'd consider giving you 25K for that, or she would, which would be me helping her probably because it's like, you know, a big upfront investment. For, but for a lot of business owners where they're, you know, they're cranking along already. I mean, I, I think all of them are good, but I like, I like the tiers. And I think the done, you know, done with you, done for you. I saw this is a really proven model. Um, I mean, again, but the, the, the best is like your 1K offer almost becomes like a lead gen for people that you're trying to get into like the, the done with you or done for you. We really want the done for you more than anything, right? But it's really just like a 1K lead gen. Um, but, you know, it's a great lead gen because it's like giving, a ton of value and obviously people are like you know gonna like be able to take that and if you're a copywriter you can um like to your point charge more like you know so the new revenue stream is, is a way to add value when you deal with other clients all that kind of stuff um and then from the perspective of like a business owner it's like some of them just want to do it themselves and like want to know the secrets so they can teach their team um but yeah man nice i like that structure a lot thank you so um if it's cool i want to kind of share the thinking behind it so people can get a lesson from it is that also cool yeah, do that. I want to get to calls in the next for seven sure. minutes, five to seven minutes. Oh, oh yeah, for sure. That, yeah, that'll be plenty of time. Okay. Um, so the way that uh, this applies to you is in your business, where can you give better customer service and give your clients and uh, your people better results faster? Um, how can you go above and beyond to ensure that they have a great experience, not only working with you, but also feel amazing about referring you to their friends and family. So I was like, okay, uh, what do the business owners really want? Okay, they want their business manager back. Okay, I'm gonna find a way to make that happen. And we did, we, there's a guy who does that, that's his specialty and he's not part of, he's one of my partners. Okay, cool. So now that I have those assets set up, now let's sell it. Right. So in your business, where are you leaving money on the table by not offering a higher tier option? Because there's always going to be somebody that wants to pay more for higher access, higher um, services. And if, if you're, you know, if, if you're a copywriter, you know, I don't want to say just a copywriter, but if, if you're a copywriter, it's like, okay, well, how does it apply? Right. Like, you know, we all know that sales letters are like, the most expensive thing or webinar is usually the most expensive thing that we can sell. Okay, sure. So then now the question is, how do you add even more white glove service to that? And instead of offering just a sales letter, you can offer an entire campaign saying, hey, you know what? Uh, I definitely recommend, you know, you get three with this, you get, so instead of charging, I don't know, what do people normally charge for sales letters, like three, five K? It depends on the person. So sure. not, it's one of the most variable things like ever. But I know, I know. To your point, like, yeah, I mean, it's a fair, like, standard price, like, like that, right? 3K, call it 3K. Yeah, sure, okay. Let's say 3K. Okay. So you charge 3K for a sales letter. Okay, that's cool. Versus you say, hey, I'm going to give you this sales letter, but I also recommend I have a higher tier package where it's a full launch campaign. So you get, you know, three Facebook ads targeted to this specific audience. Cause that's, you know, there's probably a few avatars and then you have three Facebook ads targeting another audience. And then you have two retargeting ads for each of those two audiences. And each one of those two ads are handling objections as to why they didn't click or buy or whatever. Right. So that's, so let's say you charge a hundred bucks per Facebook ad. Just that's very, that's very standard. Um, that's even like low. So three, six, that's a thousand bucks. Okay, that's four. That's, that's okay. Uh, and then you want, let's say you want to have, you know, four or five emails, launch emails to your list or to their list. And then, you know, you have three, four urgency emails and then like two follow up emails or um, retargeting emails. That's another thousand bucks. Okay, so you just took a $3,000 offer to 
And like, if you, if you charge more, let's say 150 bucks per email and Facebook ad, then it becomes like, you know, four and a half grand, five grand, or what, what is it? But five, six, um, five, yeah. six, dude, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a numbers guy. I'm a words guy. <laughs> it's like a whole segment. Copywriter is trying to do math. So yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Ian Pettis says, I've been thinking about this and it seems like you want to make sure that the higher, the higher tier package doesn't take more time per asset such that your dollar per hour doesn't end up being lower, lower overall. Um, that can be true. But if you think about it as well, I'm going to counter argue that, that that is a good thing to have in mind and make sure you're charging enough to make it worth it. But also if, if you don't have that gig specifically, think about how much time you're spending slash wasting on prospecting, dealing with clients, flakes, writing samples versus, okay, you got the gig. So I'm going to put that in there too. Yeah. Makes sense. It is interesting. I mean, to that point though, about your time, uh, just so you know, I mean, one of the things I'm doing in, the first thing I'm probably gonna offer I'm gonna do in 2021 for like cold traffic is gonna be a like challenge. Cause ooh, everyone's doing challenges. But um, but it's funny because I'm like, I'm gonna do a challenge, but then I'm gonna find a way to like invert it and just sort of like mess with the model. But like to start, we're gonna just like do the model, right? I just wanna like, like, I'm a big believer. I guess there's another lesson or thing to talk about is like, I'm like, oh cool, challenges are working really well. I'm gonna do, I wanna do challenges so that I can understand that model and write copy for it and have experience with it and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm gonna do one about like, you know, five clients in five days challenge type thing like that, something like that. Um, we're essentially right. Like I'm showing you how to get like five new clients in five days. We'll go through everything from, you know, the prospecting aspect to how to do the pitch to how to close them, all that kind of stuff. And, um, as I do that, you know, I'll just give away like my Ascension funnel on that is like, you know, that'll be like what, whatever, $97 or something like that. Um, and then. Obviously, we have freelancer freedom, which you know people will be invited to buy, which is nine ninety seven. Um, I want to create like a four to eight week coaching program, which is not done by me. Because here's one thing that was interesting: like, what well, I have to be the one to do it. And then uh, somebody pointed out to me that like, well, it's cold traffic; they don't even know you anyway. So when they sign up, like, if you're like, if once they're involved in all that, and you're like, oh, here's like a legit like coach who's really good at getting clients, like, you know, then like, um, you know, you can. Elizabeth, you're smart. I'll come back to your thing in a second, Elizabeth. Um, but like, you know, we could be coaching. So, so that as a package, but I'm not training any of my time for that. Um, and then my sort of ultimate ascension thing will be like a two day, like intensive with me, which I like doing like in person where I, the goal is get like 10 people to pay like $10,000, maybe $15,000, um, to come spend two days with me. And the promise is essentially like, I'll help you again, not FTC compliant, just like the ballpark is like, essentially I can help you to like, you know, double or triple your, uh, what you're going to make for the next year, what you're going to for the next year by spending two days with me, which is generally true. If you give me two days with somebody and I help them with how they're positioning themselves, what they're charging, what they're like, how they pitch, like really working with them closely, like I can do that. Even if you look at the Freelancer Freedom Workshop that Ian and I did, which was one day, it was like Troy Erickson that never made more than $6,000 in like a month before he we went there. And then the next month he made 20,000. The month after that, he made 32,000. The next month he made 25,000. And he's like basically, you know, making a very healthy five figures. Rob Tibble was on this call, went to that and then quit his job after um because they start making enough money to be able to quit his job like there's this little, like I know I can do that stuff so the point is um but I'm like but as I was doing I'm like that's gonna be like my funnel and I love working people in like a you know more intimate group and I'm like you know okay and then like, so then the thoughts like all right let's say you get like 200 people into the challenge or like 500 people into this challenge and you know they're freelance or the people who work with clients can they afford to pay you 10,000 say well most of them can't and that's fine because most of them shouldn't do this I only want people who I know I can truly deliver on so it's about kind of filtration and the right people I'm like, and then I'll break into like payment, like we can do two payments or three payments or whatever it is. Um, but I had to think about from an hourly rate too. And I'm like, all right, well, my goal is to make like a million dollars a month in income. That means my hourly rate is like $6,250 an hour, right? Eight hours per day working. What's eight, uh, eight times 6,250. If we do the math on that, right? Boom, $50,000 a day. So if I get 10 people to pay me $10,000 for two days, that equates to $50,000 a day, it's worth it to do it because it actually backs out to my hourly rate. Does that make sense? Where I just going back to thinking about it. Cause like, if, again, if I do the same thing, when I charge, if I make $25,000 a day, then I'm like, Oh, that doesn't make sense. But, um, but I am thinking about even for that offer, like the high ticket offer on the extension funnel, like how, um, you know, how to make it match to my, my hourly rate. Elizabeth, to your point, cause Elizabeth said, my problem is not getting clients is getting good clients. You see, the reason I said you're smart is that is actually most people's problem. And it's something that We'll be taught in this five clients to five day thing. It's like, I'm not going to like, be like, hey, go get like five people on Fiverr. Like, hey, congratulations, you got five clients. You know, you succeeded. 
Um, but at the same time, there's a difference between what the market thinks they want and what the market actually needs. And I think, you know, a lot of people in any of these things, whether you're helping coaching people get more clients or you're helping um, consultants get more clients or it's copy, it's, it's like people think they need more clients. And what, to your point, Elizabeth, they don't need more clients generally. What they need is better clients. You're gonna pay them more money. And then they need those clients to keep hiring them again and again. Um, that's what they actually need. But like what they think they need is more clients, right? And it's the same thing with like every business basically. It's like, oh, everyone's like, oh, if I had more clients, not everyone, but like a lot of people, like 80% think if I had more clients, things would be better. And so that's why that's the more appealing offer, right? Versus like the five day, get the right client challenge. Even though that might be like a better, like, you know, like really that's what they need, but that's why you have to shift it to like what people actually want. So that's my, um, oh, my that's <laughs> Uh, uh, Andy Jeffs has an off as a question about creating his own offer. What's up, Andy? Hey guys, Matt. I feel like I always, uh, you know, hog the first place on the road trip, but then I gotta, I gotta stop being. Hey, Ed, Ray, Ed Ray's playing favorites, bro. So everyone's gonna call Ed Ray out. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, he came out. Look, he's first on the Q and A thing, all right? So I'm, I'm doing my job. Okay, that's right. Okay, that's right. Um, cool. You want me to say my question again? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, I am in the process of launching an offer. I'm trying to figure out what my mothership is just going back to like Jay Devolt's talk in the Copy Accelerator call, which was awesome. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I have a vision for what I want to do and I've been doing a lot of research on the market and I've found basically similar offers to what I want to do. Go about researching these projects, uh, the, these offers, sorry, and then like creating my own unique thing that kind of stands out. Like my first initial thoughts is like just do RMBC and kind of pinpoint what what these offers like their big promises, what their unique mechanism is, and all of that. And then obviously, you know, just kind of do a slight shift with my own thing. Um, but I'm just curious to hear your guys' thoughts when it comes to creating a new offer um, and how to go about that. You know based on what I've just said. Yeah, for sure. And so what are the, and you may have said this because my Wi-Fi is still sucking. So, but right. what are the, like what, what vertical? The, the vertical, sorry? What vertical, yeah, what vertical? Is the offer going to be in? This is like, like, under, like music, what niche? Oh, what niche, yeah. So it's the music niche. And um, I'm basically combining my skills from, you know, obviously being a dating coach, helping people with like social confidence, finding their purpose, their why and stuff with online marketing, you know, making money online and stuff. So I want to. Build more confidence, influence and recognition. So um, what I'm seeing a lot in offers that are similar to what I'm trying to do is like the big promise is usually based around like build and monetize a loyal fan base. I think if that, if, if I was to give you like the first promise that comes off the top of my head from like my research, I feel like it would be like build and monetize a loyal fan base kind of thing. Like that's, that's kind of, you know, what I'm going for. Got to. And by the way, people mm -hmm. saying that I should connect to my hotspot. I can try that. However, I don't get very good reception at my house because I'm like up against the mountains. So that might not work. Yeah. I'm not in the place. So for people in chat, that's why I'm not connected to the hotspot because I'm not in a place with um, it'll become weak. Okay. So monetizing a following. Okay. And and how have you done that in the past, like so far within the dating niche? Is that no, right? no, yeah. that's the thing. I uh, say, so, you know, I, I'd have to kind of take on some of my musician friends as like a, a case study and and get them some outcomes, you know. But I am working, I, I, I'm starting this with a business partner I got in contact with a guy from the Justin Stephan Talk Coffee Group who helps musicians with email marketing and he's making um, musicians money right now so I kind of have some help there in terms of showing results and stuff. Got you. So cool. I'm thinking about it. so I mean so yeah so what are they what do they what do they really want? What are, the, what are the musicians, what are their hopes? They, they want, yeah, like musicians, and I can speak from being a musician myself that, you know, we're attention whores and we just want people to like love us and follow us and, you know, acknowledge our, our, our that we want our, 
our art to you know make a difference and we want it you know people to like you know we, we, we want people to follow us and we want to if that's making sense there you know they they want they want to be heard more than anything i think like when it comes to the monetization side of things it's like yeah that's nice but what they really want is for people to know who they are you know that's what i'm getting yeah and so do you think probably would it be like an info product around this to start right or like a like it's like a train yeah I mean, I've already got an idea for like a lead magnet that I could start promoting. And, you know, I, I, I'm going to build an email list, a YouTube channel, and then probably a Facebook group of this and, you know, diversify on different platforms as I go along. Um, but I think some kind of like info product slash lead magnet to start with. But what I really want to do, and I, th I think it'd be the, the coolest thing would be basically emulating what Coffee Accelerator does. Like, I, I don't know if you watch JD Welts talk. That he did the other day but the whole mothership idea like i feel like my mothership idea would probably be some kind of like coaching program and then you know there'll be different marketing assets underneath that you know okay yeah we just wrapped up andy's question basically told him start high ticket and descend from there based on his email list and adjust his offer based on feedback that's it cool makes sense cool uh let's see who has a good question by the way please uh give a thumbs up on the um question that you like the most and i will take that into consideration when choosing what to get answered next um next up is lorraine asking about the challenges of being a copywriter hey lorraine hello i am so glad you're back Stefan. yay for now for now we'll see <laughs> okay I, i'm gonna talk real fast okay <laughs> yeah i've always wanted to know this about you that's one of the things i've always wanted to know like your biggest challenge and how you get over it just biggest challenge on copywriting in general or yes like, just copyright becoming a copywriter yes yes um are we talking about like early on or are we talking about like today probably early on when you were first starting is I've, I've, okay yeah um i mean i think the one of the biggest challenges is the feast and famine cycle okay. um right there's the idea of like you get some clients and you have like a really good month but then as soon as it can feel as though as soon as you are able to actually relax and you may even plan like, Oh, next month, I'm going to take a few days off or a week off or whatever it is. Um, but then suddenly, you know, you realize that you don't have enough money to do that and you're stressed and you're hustling and you're trying to find clients and you know, you're kind of like uh, nervous about paying the bills and stuff like that. I mean, that's probably the biggest challenge, uh, you know, that, and then maybe that would get tied with like uh, a challenge of confidence. You know, the worry of like not knowing if like what you wrote is actually good or not. Is it, you know, are you on the right track? Uh, are you, is what you give the client going to actually work and get results for them? And I think those are probably the two biggest. Um, you know, the second one is really solved in a lot. Uh, a lot of it's solved by the RMBC method, which is, you know, why I'm such a big proponent. Obviously, I created it, but I'm a big proponent of it. Um, cause I think it helps you to create better copy more consistently. Um, it also helps, you know, just practice and, and getting wins and stuff like that. Um, and on the feast and famine side, it's really about, you know, getting the same clients to hire you over and over again, and then get referrals. I think that's the biggest thing. It's like early on for me, um, even when with copy, but I was doing other stuff too, but I was doing all kinds of like email copy and SEO and all that, but it's like, uh, Dr. Farrow, who I've talked about before, he's been on the show, not like as a guest, but um, a visitor and stuff. But he, um, this guy hired me on like Upwork and I did a bunch of email marketing for him. And then he introduced me to uh, this guy named Dr. Guy Annunziata, who runs a company called, at the time it was called Brain Core Therapy. I think it's called Brain Core Systems Inc. Um, and they had like, he does like something called neurofeedback. And then he had like 120 doctors who were licensing his brand and technology. Um, and so then I did a good job for Dr. Guy of his SEO and stuff like that. And then, um, then Dr. Guy was like, I was like, Hey, you know, can I market to your 120 doctors? And he was like, yes. So then I was able to market to those 120 doctors and I helped some of them. And then they referred me to people. So that was really the first time in my life where I know I lied for a second, but that was, if that makes sense, the first time in my life, it was because like, mm -hmm. I did a good job for one person. He introduced me to another person. That person introduced me to more people. Um, and that was really the, the 
when I get started getting enough steady income that I was still stressed because I still had to work a lot at that point in my career, sure. but at least I had enough, like, cause I got people on retainers and stuff like that for what I was doing. So that was enough that it was like steady income that I wasn't worried about not being able to pay the bills, you know? Nice. Very good. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Loving that. Appreciate you. Cool. Yeah. I'm happy I was Thank able to, to stick around. For... And you stuck around. Yeah. It didn't stand me up. Thank you so much, Stefan. Appreciate it. <laughs> my, my pleasure. And I'm going to turn off my camera. We'll see if that helps but cool all right next up we have Mattia Chiara Velotti asking about sending more emails what's up Mattia hi Stefan what's up you can you hear me yeah I can hear you yeah that's just just a fear that I hear a lot like people are afraid to send like three emails a week especially when it comes to restaurants and cafes because they they think all right it's too much so people will bother people will annoy people and they unsubscribe from our uh, newsletter so what do you think I mean I told them it's not a matter of frequency it's a matter if you give value to yeah. them but still like yeah it's it's a fear that I hear a lot um I know like for personal coaches or coaches of any sort like it's easier to send more emails but when it comes to this industry like people are reluctant so what would you say to them and how would you approach the email marketing in order to send more emails it's really tough because they're going to be really stuck in their way because they're not marketers and so you can give them all the facts and data on the road but they're still going to be I think A, you have to almost accept like an 80-20 principle here and like 80% of them aren't going to do it no matter how compelling of a case you make and just focus on the 20% that will. Um, then I think you need to ideally have case studies. You know, like I, I shared this at like Shanda Sumter's event and, and I went back to teach the RMBC method like six months after that or a year after that. I, I don't know, maybe six months, nine months after. And a bunch of the people, the first talk I did was about email marketing and talking about how you can email your list every day. And I had a bunch of people be like, I was like, I didn't believe you. I was full of shit. I thought you were full of it. And then like, I started doing it and like, I tripled my revenue on my email list since like you, you know, talked the first time. And it's like, yeah, cause you're like, oh, this is amazing. So if you can, if you can have a couple of case studies of like other restaurants that have done that and show, you know, the results they got, then I think that's really helpful. I think the other thing to do look at, or, you know, is probably just be like, hey, totally get it. Let's just try this for, you know, two weeks and see what happens. And if you, you know, let's track the unsubscribes, let's check spam complaints, and then let's check, you know, if there's a measurable, like, uh, way to track ROI on this, like, you know, more people coming through the door or people, like, responding or engagement. And, like, I think if you kind of give them, like, you know, let them make a micro commitment to it. Like, okay, let's try it for a week. And then let's just see if what you're saying is true. And if it's true, then I will not push it anymore. We'll go back to doing it, you know, once a week or whatever it is. And if it's not true, then, you know, let me kind of keep going. Cause I, this is like proven. So probably that'd be my biggest one besides like case studies would be great. And then like micro commitments. So the thing is, I don't know any restaurants that do this. Do you? No. And so again, you're kind of like the pioneer of the arrows in your back. So while I think it's a really good idea, I think restaurants should be doing it. Like, you know, I've talked about this, you and I've talked about it via an email correspondence. I put a post about this in like the beginning of like last March or April, how I thought businesses should do this stuff too. Um, and so, but I think you have to also think of it this way. Like if you cannot get restaurants to come on board with it, then are you, do you have the wrong offer right now? You know what I'm saying? Like, Maybe you should actually, maybe you shouldn't be trying to do this. Maybe you should be trying to do something else for them that gets people through the door, like lead gen or whatever it is, or don't work with restaurants, but you know, up to you, but like basically something like that. And then if you can give them a win somewhere else, then they may be more likely to then trust you or be willing to try to do like multiple, you know, to, to email more often, but it may be something where that's not what you lead with. That's not your lead offer. It's like something you bring into the mix after like, a month or two of success and then get them to like see and then as you have more and more people doing it you can just point to like all of your clients who are having success and be like you know because then i think it becomes an easier sell but maybe getting through the door maybe you, you need to devise a different um thing to be focused on on selling them right now mm -hmm. yeah makes sense makes sense cool yeah that's the best i got because again i think um you know it's hard it's hard to sell the market on something that they something brand new, a brand new, it's hard to sell an idea and a brand new idea. And, you know, people are resistant to change. So 
that yeah that's what i would do sure i mean even if it's for now it's like they're okay with one email a week so i think i'll go for that and then if we can prove that that works we're going to increase to two or three emails a week so and let's hope this can turn into a case study so we'll see <laughs> i'll let you know yeah for sure cool man well yeah keep me posted thank you thank All you right. very much thanks all right, <clears throat> next up, we have a question from Nick about up and down productivity. What's up, Nick? How we doing? doing yeah. Better now that my Wi-Fi seems to be okay, knock on wood. Good. I'm glad I, glad I got the good Wi-Fi, Stefan. Hopefully. Um, yeah, yeah, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> so the question I asked was, I have a lot of really good weeks in a row, and then suddenly it'll turn into good days, bad days in terms of productivity. Eventually, yep. I get my shit together, and I'm back on being focused and disciplined. But then eventually, I end up back in a rut, and I have to break myself out of it again. So you and I together have talked about, like, when we were in Vegas last week, um, talking about diffuse thinking versus focused thinking. Yeah. And, like, the thing that I think I go through a lot, though, is during those diffuse thinking periods, I feel... I'm like barely scraping by. I can't get clients. Like I'm doing well. I'm comfortable at this point, but I definitely have this desire and potential that I want to grow. I want to get bigger. I want to do more, but sometimes I find myself falling more into those like diffuse thinking periods. And I'm wondering whether it's just me being lazy, which most of the time it is. I mean, if I'm being completely honest, is it just me being lazy? Is it okay for me to be lazy? Should I take some time to just kind of rest and let my mind think or am I not living up to my full potential there and could I be getting like an extra step on all of my competition because most people are going to be resting but then at that same time if I use that time just to get better doing the things maybe that I don't want to do but that I know will push my career forward in terms of just all the various different little disciplines I think that it takes to be like a super high performer so yeah I mean I guess my question is just your thoughts on this your advice, if you've ever gone through anything similar to that, I, I feel like it's a fairly common thing that like other people can agree with me that maybe they experience something similar to that. hundred um, percent. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've talked about this with, uh, can we do a while back? And I think I wrote an email for the subject line, um, like the paradoxical nature of downtime, which is that I think, you know, the paradox of downtime is that it makes you more productive. Um, I think that is absolutely true if you're you know your body or your mind or whatever is like we need a break and you constantly deny it that break because you're like i should be doing more getting better getting ahead is you you may get some incremental gains in the short term but then you're going to hit this burnout mode where you're going to your, your body and your mind are going to win out in the long run anyway and you're going to erase those gains because instead of just taking the weekend off or taking like a few days during the week where you sort of are quote unquote lazy, but then come back revitalized, um, you know, you're going to reach a burnout where it takes like a month or longer and you don't like, um, you know, where, and, and you're going to suffer more because of that. So I think that those periods are, are important. I think they're part of it is yes, you probably are doing some diffuse thinking when you are doing, taking that downtime. Um, but I just also think like, if you look at where you are at your age and you look at like, like, you know, like you just have to have balance in your life, I feel. So to me, I wouldn't, I, I think that the big thing is it's almost like we're, 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 the, we're downtime is the worst is because we beat ourselves up about it. And we're like, yeah, I'm a lazy piece of shit. Like, oh, what's wrong with me? Why am I not grinding? Why am I? And then we kind of beat ourselves up a bunch about it. And then like, then it becomes like almost fetish, fetishized or like a, um, like an addictive cycle of behavior where it's like we work hard then we have downtime then we hate ourselves a bunch then we get ourselves out of yeah. it really good and it's almost like a um a, like a like a weird sort of way of um creating like dopamine hits for ourselves but i think that when you remove that and you just sort of say yeah you know what this is like i'm just not gonna be doing as much this week um i really think that that's how you how you manage uh i think that's good if you just embrace it, say all right cool all right so so it goes you know like if it, if it goes if it, if it spills into you know, next week and I've got stuff to get done, I'm not getting it done, then I think I really have to maybe, you know, at that point evaluate. But if it's like my, if I just feel like I need a few days to chill and that's what my my body and my mind are telling me, then, um, you know, I'm just going to do it. So that's, I think you should just embrace yeah. it. Yeah, I guess it's just like having control over that 
ability to just like hey i want to chill out because sometimes I mean, when i say control i mean both angles like especially just on the side of when it starts it sometimes lingers past a couple more days than i'd like for it to um and i guess the big thing for me is wondering whether you know a lot of times it turns into me watching movies or just kind of like fucking around on youtube or whatever or just you know just doing whatever i really like to do outside of that and it's not like I have a burning passion to do these things. I just, I happen to find South Park funny. Like I like comedy. I, I like laughing. So I like doing those things, but I always wonder if for the side of, okay, do, you know, especially going back to what you said about, um, you know, my age. So, I mean, just for context, for people that are outside of this, like I'm 21. So, I mean, I've already seen like decent amount of success at 21 for copywriting, which I'm not like at all trying to like brag about. I mean, it's just to kind of give context. Like I've done well, um, but part of me also always asks that question that what if, just what if for the next like year or two, you kind of just only focused on copy. And then after that, once you come out of it, you're 23, 24 at that point, one, you'd be way better at copywriting. So you could charge way more and kind of like, you know, exactly what we're talking about with freelancer freedom too, is like, just be able to command ridiculously high prices for your work because you're really freaking good. You know, like you've obviously dedicated yourself to the craft, which I think every guy and, and girl that is able to charge like the amounts that all of us want to be able to charge for our sales letters. It's because they've committed a lot of time to it. And one of the upsides of me being 21 is like, I have a insane amount of time i don't have kids i have dogs which are very low maintenance but it's like i have all this time that i could push towards that and part of me always wonders that like what if i just did that whatever uh, a year or two years of just straight that's all i focus on and it's no distractions none of the um and i would still say there's like downtime in there but it's just more focused downtime yeah but like well, i mean what's the focus like if you go to diffuse like thinking again it's the idea that um like watching a movie or you know video on youtube or whatever it is like you're giving your brain time off and your brain's like doing stuff in the background right so yeah. that's good like your brain needs like it's like running your like redlining your like a sports car all the time like the engine overheats and it's not good for the car and it breaks down yeah like driving like, you know kind of every now and then you know redline it sure um i you know i would think about how like, I think focusing on specific things is like, cool. Yeah, like focus on copy if you want to focus on copy, but that doesn't mean you still can't have like, you know, plenty of stretches of downtime and and just like relax. I mean, I, you know, for me, I'm 35. I started getting good at copy when I was like 28 or 29, you know? Um, yeah, I'm 35. Wait, wasn't I surprised that I'm 35? Do you think I was older or younger? I thought you were like 30. No, yeah, I feel like I'm just, um, I am on my head. On my head, I'm 30. But... Especially after that naughty photo you posted on Facebook yesterday. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like, I'm 35. I didn't start getting good at copy until I was 28 or 29. I mean, I didn't like become like a millionaire until like my like early 30s and you know, that was with also doing, you know, all the, all the, the different issues I've, I've dealt with in my life from like substance, you know, abuse issues in my early twenties. And then even in my thirties, like ups and downs, I mean, I've lost, you know, millions of dollars in failed business ventures, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. Right. And so, I mean, I think the point is like, you know, you're 21, if you're, you, you can do everything you're doing now and still have downtime and you're still going to be like, like ahead of everybody else at 24 or 25 you know, with the downtime, like that, it's not like optimizing all of your downtime to like, you know, oh, when I do downtime, I'm going to read and then I'm going to watch a TED talk. I mean, like, that's not downtime. Like maybe reading, if you read fiction, sure. But it's like, it's not actually downtime. Like you just need that. And yeah. you need to be happy. Like, are you taking like the weekend off right now? Like, are you, do you take um, the weekend off normally? It, it's like, yeah, I mean, I still take days off now, but I don't, this is, I mean, it's kind of a weird thing to say, but I genuinely don't just follow like the, <laughs> for appointments and setting things up, I'll follow Monday through Sunday. But for my lifestyle, it's not really like, okay, Saturday and Sunday, I take days off. It's just like, if I want to take the day off, I'll take the day off and then I'll take the next day off. I don't even know if it's a Tuesday or a Thursday. I all the time don't know what day it is. I have to rely on a calendar. <laughs> yeah, but that's a good flow. I mean, I think that works. Or like for me, I really try to take the weekends off besides, I'll still do my stuff from like when I wake up in the morning until 
my daughter gets up, but then I like pretty much don't work on the weekends and like, I want to, yeah. work, but I do yeah. find that that's helpful because like I've talked about before, even like um, the whole idea of Hemingway stopping every day he'd write and then he would stop in the middle of a sentence because then he'd be like kind of pissed. He'd want to finish the sentence and then he'd yeah. start the next day and like know exactly where he like left off and be excited to start, you know? And I kind of feel like it's the same thing mm. with the weekend off. It's like, oh my God, I've got some stuff I want to do. Um, but then when I come back Monday, I'm just like, all right, time to do it. So I think like weekends off are good. I mean, you know, stopping working. I, you know, I just, I just think most of us think we have to like, we almost have like guilt if we're not working long hours and stuff like that. Um, and I just, yeah. I just don't think that's true, you know? Yeah. That, the other thing also is I remember reading in one of your emails recently where you were saying that you, um, you started working at 4 a.m. and you do like two hours of just like straight, just what's the word that you use for it? It was a book that it's based off of uh, deep work. Like you would focus on just deep work for the first two hours every day. And I've been doing that. So it's like, even, even on my non-productive days, I'm still pretty freaking productive. Uh, Cause I'll still always get like at least two, three hours of writing in. Um, but yeah, I guess, I guess I understand what you're saying. It's also just a matter of me being able to kind of chill out and slow down a bit versus that side of me. That's like, <laughs> it's like Ricky Bobby. Like I want to go fast. I want to go fast. Yeah, for sure. But I think again, like, yeah, I think you go fast into like, you know, fast off a cliff. Right. Um, yeah. So no, I think, I think you're on the right track. I mean, I think of that too, dude, honestly, like with, cause of Eden and my daughter, her age are like three. And I think what Carly and Inglade Cole, who did all of her stuff early in the morning and with like that magic morning time, it's like, I basically, besides, you know, okay, a few phone calls, like I wrote to a billion and a copy of story weekly call. I'm like, I could just totally stop working at like, you mm -hmm. know, like 8 30 every day and i'd still be i still generate over a million dollars a year in income you know what i mean so it's like mm -hmm. but then I, I don't know I'm, I'm also i like to work a lot but the point is yeah just, that's the problem that's the yeah. big problem is i freaking love working like i'll go to bed mad sometimes thinking about a sales letter like exactly what you just said with the hemingway thing and it's like i sometimes won't be able to put my like i can't go to bed because i'm just focused on whatever trying to connect the dots whatever i put together today and I, the problem is that I really, really, really like it. Like the research side of things is so fun for me and being able to piece everything together and like basically wrestle with the idea that I'm trying to create for the sales letter or for a VSL. Yeah, hundred percent. But I mean, I think that's good. So yeah, ultimately though, I think like just embrace it and, um, and like, you know, kind of force yourself to have downtime. Cause again, the other thing, think of it selfishly and greedily too. Like now we'd be more productive, but like Sam put in the chat, how if she doesn't take weekends off her ideas suck. It's like the same way. Like it's like every time I actually take a few days off and I'm like laying by a pool or, or if I'm on vacation or or whatever it is, I get like mm. all these really good ideas. Like the idea for that uh, reality like a uh, TV show that I want to do like kind of came about because I was mm -hmm. like thinking around. Like a lot of my best ideas come when I'm not actually working. And it's like if you don't give yourself that time, then you're gonna you're gonna deprive yourself and your clients of all kinds of ideas, including ideas that could potentially change your life and get you way further ahead than you know everyone else is who's your age true all right well i'll take it to heart man sweet awesome good question ed ray beautiful i think you turned, you turned off your camera after i turned off mine bro it feels weird that i'm the only person with a camera on it was yeah. nice because then people at least had a vision at you know? a dinner party dude no that's fine that's fine we'll go we're going to true radio you know radio station mode today girlin if you miss my eyebrows look at my freaking photo dude who we got next, Ed? I'm thinking. Okay, you think? Use that brain. Yeah. Don't ask me to do. Don't ask me to do math, though, please. Uh, cool. We got a question here from Gerlene. Gerlene, Gerlene. About a potential client. If this is like a legit radio show, then I would have like a thing that like that was like a version of like the Jolene song that when girly we played is like a sound effect every four girls come on every time. We probably at this point, I'm surprised that no one has done an actual like cover of it with how many people sing the song with my name. <laughs> There's still time, you know. Oh well, Ed could play. He could play guitar and then you sing, Stefan. I can play guitar too, and I can Yo, start a trash guitar play. I would be a fire band. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, my question is, uh, so right now I'm speaking to a potential client and yeah, he an, owns an agency and based off our uh, chat, it seems like the work each month is going to be very, very random. He has a lot of work lined up and he said if this, these projects go well, then 
I'll give you more work. Um, my question is just really, since the projects are random, does that mean I should just push for payment per project? Like if it's a VSL one month, then charge what I normally would, et cetera, et cetera. And also the second part to that question is, um, he's also looking for someone that will, I guess, consult time to time because he said his team is very good at what they do. But when it comes to the actual copy part in terms of uh, basically almost like visuals, like where they should have pop ups, if they should have pop ups when you're scrolling down, when the sales thing would, you know, like stuff like that. He just needs someone to like give them tidbits on that as well. And I don't know how to approach that as far as um, Basically, I don't want to get overloaded with them bombarding me with questions. Like, I think I forgot what the word is, like the, that creep thing when you sign up to do something, but then they just, then it just adds on and your workload like just skyrockets. Yeah, for scope sure. Scope creep. Yeah, scope creep. Yeah. Um, I mean, if it's going to be really variable, it's hard to like to, to create a retainer based on that. I mean, you've, you could if you're like, well, I'm gonna need at least X amount of hours per like week or month or whatever. But I think if it were me, I probably would do it project based mm -hmm. um, to start. And then I think on the consulting, I'd just be like, oh cool, I'm happy to do consulting, but like, you know, it's just X amount per hour. I just charge an hourly rate um, in addition to that for the consulting stuff. Oh, I see. So you would kind of just separate in that sense. So if you asked me like, oh, I'd like you to consult or give advice for XX, I'd be like, sure, I can do it for an hour for this much. Like just really just separate it. Yeah, I mean, that's what I would do. I mean, I think if it's just like, you know, obviously the person just has random questions, they pay you like, you know, 5,000 or 7,000 or four, whatever it is for like a VSL. And then they have questions about the VSL implementation, like within reason, you should just answer the questions. Yeah, you know? yeah. But if you're like, oh, you know, can you help me like audit my marketing funnel and go through the copy and see the opportunities? Like, oh, for sure. Yeah, you know, I charge X per hour. So um, oh, okay. you know, like, I think it would probably take like one hour or three hours. So, you know, if something up, that's cool. We can, we can get it scheduled. Oh, okay, awesome. That makes a whole lot more sense. Yeah, that's why I was confused because some questions, if they just simply asked if I've given them something, yeah, for sure, I'll answer and give some some tidbits, but I just didn't know how to approach like the other side of it where you just explained if they just asked me, can you go through this and tell me what to do better? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I would just charge them for that. All right, cool. That sounds good. Thanks a lot. Yeah, you were welcome, Gerline. Ed Ray. Shalom. Shalom. So. Question here from Rob about booking clients in advance. What's up, Rob? Rob Tidwell? He's muted. There he hi, is. Hi, friends. Hi, friends. Hi, Ed. Oh. Hi, Stefan. Hey. Oh, so, yeah, I have a question. <clears throat> so I'm kind of like going through a, a change in my freelancing side of things <clears throat> um and I've never been really good at like booking clients out far I always just because it seems like everybody's in a rush <laughs> right. um which uh, at least from my experience um so I've never been too good at booking clients out in advance but I'd like to change that uh, especially now as I'm kind of pivoting to specialize in upsells uh, I got some stuff in the works on that but um just wondering how to go about that or if you have any advice on booking out in advance. What, um, how long does it usually take you to actually do the upsells for the clients? Like, I guess like work hours or whatever. Oh, I'd like a day, two days if I, you know, after edit. I mean, upsells are really quick. That's what's yeah. <laughs> really great about, you know, upsells from my perspective. But that's going away from like, I've been mostly just long form and it takes like, you know, I, I, yeah, I give myself like a month for these projects to make sure I do a good job. <clears throat> um, so I'm, I'm kind of transitioning and then I get close to the end of the project and I'm like, oh, now I've been lucky because I've been working with like the same clients keep coming back. But I'm like, in the back of my mind, I'm a little worried like, well, what if they stop launching products and or whatever? Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that based on that, I, you know, I, I want to like, I go slower than fast when it comes to like, you know, booking in advance. But I mean, if you can, upsells are a little bit tough because I think people do have an expectation that they can get done faster, right? So do you say like, how long do you tell them right now that the turnaround time is going to be? Do you tell them four weeks or is that for long form that you tell them four weeks? Oh, that's long form yeah. for, I, 
you know, because I do have multiple projects, I've been giving myself like two weeks to write an upsell because, you know, I have other stuff going on. Um, <clears throat> it's not, it, it, but I want to kind of switch from that. It just depends on what I have in my plate as to how far I book out. But like a lot of like, say, for example, on our jobs board and copy accelerator, they're like pretty much 90% of them are like, we want this in the next month. Like, oh, well, I'm busy for the next month. But if you gave me another month or two, I'd be down for it. And so it's just kind of, it hasn't been a problem. I haven't run out of work yet, but I've gotten nervous once or twice this year. I'd rather, I'm trying to simplify my life, really. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, maybe that part of that, though, is, is if you want to, like, for example, specialize in upsells, then, you know, you wouldn't have as many things sort of like booked out. And if, like, you, you'd have, if you do two a day, right, in theory, you could do like three upsell like packages a week, right? Which is like 12 a month. And not that necessarily want to be writing that many upsells all the time. Uh, but, but I'm guessing it seems like you probably get upsells, but then you also get long form. And then you're trying to like balance the upsells plus the long form kind of, right? Is that part of it? Yeah, that's where I'm at right now. Because <clears throat> I'm not strictly doing upsells. Right. I'm not even sure if that's going to be a thing, but I'm, a, I'm trying to bring in as many as I can. Like I've even thought about putting up, I mean, I've never had a website, never needed a website. Doing a website with like just all my testimonials that I'm collecting right now for my upsells, just to have something, I don't know, to send people to. I don't even know if that's worth it, but. So yes, right now I'm balancing long form and then trying to fit in these upsells. Right. Um... Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to book out more. I mean, I book out like generally, I just tell like, you know, everyone like an eight week turnaround time, basically. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm also not doing, I'm getting paid a lot and I'm not doing uh, a super high volume. Um, you know, I think as you get better and reputation gets better, obviously that helps. Like one person paid me like 50 grand to just reserve a spot in 2021 for me. Um, <laughs> which was like, great. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. But it does help. I mean, that as you have a reputation, because like, I mean, I've thought about that where I'm like, I could literally put a calendar out and be like, hey, I'm gonna do one letter a month in 2021. It's like, you know, 50000 or $55,000 per letter. Like, here's like the go in here now if you want to try and book me out, you know, and like have like an opening for each month. And then just like, if I like, if I blasted that a bunch, I could probably book out like, you know, 12 letters and $600,000 of upfront income by doing that. But obviously, like, I've got the reputation to make that happen. Um, yeah. As you get better and better results, I mean, that does become easier. And as you become better and better known, it just goes back to kind of continue to market yourself and brand yourself and things like that. Um, but if you could, yeah, maybe if you want to try, if you can find that you can sustain yourself by just doing upsells and create a really good niche for yourself there, at that point, I think you'll be able to book out more in advance anyway. Um, but, you know, for the, I don't have a great answer for you. I don't know. Do you have anything you want to add to it? Cause I'm sorry. I mean, like, I, I think like it kind of like, it's just the reality of your schedule. I don't know how you're going to be able to get people to like, if people really, if you're in demand, then you can get away with it. You're like, Hey, you know, like you want to reserve a spot with me for like, you know, three months from now or so. I mean, people can reserve a spot, but like they, they have, you have to be high enough in demand for them to do that. In that case, you accept either payment up front or a down <laughs> and, and, and slot sing in the calendar but people have to be like, I have to work with Rob and nobody else. So that's that's the part that really has to be overcome beyond everything else. Right. I guess I just hear these fantasy stories like, oh, such and such is booked four months out. I'm like, wow, how do you do that? <laughs> well, I don't know if that's reality or not. But... Or so. I mean, it, like, it can be, but again, everybody was like, oh my God, Rob Tidwell is like the best, you know, in the road at upsells. Like I would just kill to work with him. Then it's super easy. So part of it is just like you you know, continuing to position yourself as like the best of the, like I could do that. But again, I've, I've, you know, have this crazy track record and all that kind of stuff, but like, you know, you, I mean, you could do something like, yeah, I know like um, Elizabeth just said holidays book around holiday season. I mean, you can also do, you could do like, Hey, like, look, like here's all the results I've gotten for clients. Here's the crazy testimonials I'm crushing. Like, you know, if you're like, but I'm getting booked up. Like if you want to get the tax right off now and like reserve me for 2021, then like, here's where you can book me, you know, for like, you know, a project starting in February. I mean, you can try stuff like that, but it just really comes down to like, you know, your, your reputation more than anything else. Sure. Makes sense. I'll just keep trucking. It's going well. I'm just, I'm getting excited for 2021. I got a bunch of stuff on my, in my head. So 
trying to make things easier on myself. Thanks, Maybe man. We start try to start charging a little bit higher rates too, though. If you're so booked up all the time, you know what I mean. Not if you're existing client, but you can. But even with newer clients, like start charging a little bit more because then that might potentially keep your calendar a little bit more open, but in like a good way because you're still you well, know, getting paid more. Yeah, I actually did just finally started charging um, five figures for a sales letter, and that's it's made it better. But it feels like I'm doing less work. I don't know. It's a weird head place. Like good. making more money but doing less work. I'm like. Well, like, I should get more work. Ah. Yeah, I think that is something too. We try to like fill that vacuum, right? It's like that comes back to like a self worth thing and like a guilt thing, where you're almost like, oh, I paid me all this money, and but it was kind of easy to do it, so therefore, like they shouldn't have paid me this money, or I don't deserve this money, or I better find more work, or I better, you know, there's a lot of stuff like that. But it's also like a point in your life where it's like, oh, no, don't be afraid to also just be enjoying your life now and having feeling blessed that you have money and you have the ability to have downtime that you have the ability to spend time with your family. I mean, I would assume, and then don't live outside of your means to the point where if you lose all of your clients next month, suddenly like everything would go to shit and you'd be in a desperate panic situation. You know what I mean? Make sure you're putting money, saving money, stuff like that too. I think that's really the approach there. Yeah. And I'm finally in a good spot. Um, it's been a good year for me. So I'm just, I'm doing much better, but I'm just always trying to improve. So thanks, man. Appreciate it. Absolutely, dude. Happy to help. Rob, you are the man. He's so clean shaven in this photo. I know. What a handsome gent. Every time I see him, he's got like the huge burns and like a little beard kind of coming in, all that kind of stuff. Such a cutie. All right, question here from Ian Pettit around blocks around pursuing too many prospects at once. What's up, Ian Pettit? Hey, how you guys doing? Good, how you doing? Excellent. How are you? I'm feeling pretty good. The sun's shining here in Indiana, so uh, hey, I can't ask for much more. Pride of, uh, pride of Fort Wayne right here. Yeah, man. That's uh, interesting to hear that. Come back and see your roots sometime, Stefan, you know? I the will. Summit City. Happily do that in the summertime. There you, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so anyway, um, sort of the longer story is that around the time you guys were doing the uh, copy accelerator live event <clears throat> i had told myself well i'll i'll go if i can like land a, a, enough client work to pay for it right? right and i came just short of that but at the time i was in talks with like sort of the one client i actually have right now which has been the dream client that i've been chasing right he's like a i don't know how many figures influencer like he's got like a net worth of 400 million dollars and he's got an offer out there and it looks awesome and so i was like well you know maybe i can help out and i sent them the cold emails i did that thing and uh his marketing guy was like these are great let's try out some stuff and uh i i knew it was going to be a little bit of a problem because at first he just wanted the checkout page done and i'm like okay you know little test project but when i looked at their funnel i was like dude, your headline is not great. Like the emails aren't great, but okay, okay, we'll do it. So we got done with that. He's like, all right, thanks. And, you know, I got paid and all that. And then, you know, it was a little bit, it was like crickets. And then he said, um, out of the blue, he like messages me. He's like, hey, how's things going? I need help. We're not converting. And I had been like, you guys need your sales page done. So I like did him a sales page. I like redid it like up front because I'm trying to, you know, get this guy. I'm, I'm relatively new. I'm relatively untested, all of that stuff. So like did like a $2,500, $2,500, 2,500 word sales page. And it's like, Merry Christmas. Let me know how it converts. And it's again, crickets. And so on the one hand, I want, I really would like to have that on my resume is like, I got these guys, you know, increase their conversions rates, get a great testimonial from like a big name because that's like a major foot in the door for, you know, that's like a powerful testimonial. But at the same time, I'm having these long gaps of, of communication. I don't know if I should just say, hey, listen, dude, like if you don't wanna work with me, please just tell me and give up the chance to have that whale client testimonial. Or if I should just, and again, to the main part of the question, which is that like, when I think about taking on lots and lots of different clients at once or, or putting out lead gen stuff and, and then trying to do that all at once, I, I'm really nervous about 
over promising and then under delivering because I've got too many irons in the fire, which is a tendency I have. So I'm, I'm just trying to avoid that. So, you know, how do I balance that? Should, is it worth it to give up um, the opportunity for that really, you know, awesome client testimonial because I want money now? Yeah, I mean, I think you can do both, though. I don't think you need to just wait around for them. I mean, I think you should continue, like I think it's people in the chat as well. But I think, you know, following following up is really important. Um, you know, like, it's just like the bigger the client is, the more they have going on and the busier they get and the less responsive they can be, you know? I mean, it's, it's just like a, a rule and it's not necessarily anything like, you know, personal to you or that doesn't, you know, that your copy's not working or anything like that. It's just that they've just got a bunch of, you know, stuff going on. So I think like, you know, I wouldn't like give up on them or even send an email, like an ultimatum type email. I just would mm-hmm. you know, follow up like, Hey, check in, how to go. Let me know. would love to work with you more in 2021. Um, you know, and just follow up with them pretty consistently. I think that's cool. And I think as you're doing that, yeah, like again, I wouldn't just sit around waiting. It's like I would go out and get a few more clients. I don't think, you know, it has to be something where you're like, oh, I guess I better go overload myself with clients. It's like I would just go out and prospect and try and get another, you know, client or two and, and ideally take some, you know, if you want to take like one off projects on it so you can sort of like just do work that then you get through. And then by the time you're done with that, if the, um, if this dream client happens to, you know, turn into like a retainer or something like that. Uh, then you know you still have flexibility. I don't think you need to go get other like don't go get, replace that with like crappy small retainers. But um, but I would definitely be looking at you know getting a few more kind of gigs. But don't overload yourself. Just get a couple. I mean, if you're not doing anything right now, then getting one or two more clients would be you know manageable and bring money in today, and you'll be beneficial. You don't need to go get like five or seven or ten and overload yourself. So don't look at it in such a binary way. I guess is my mm-hmm. advice. Right, right. Because in the meantime, I had because I was like, well, I've got to do something. So I had started working on like, um, sort of like my personal media platform, as it were, <clears throat> building a website and, and trying to have a platform to, to put my blog posts rather than just on LinkedIn. Um, but that's not like, that's not even really money later, certainly not money now. And, and money now is kind of where I'm at. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, and I think that part of what's disappointing is that there was a lot of sunk time cost in researching to get that voice down right and so I have a few other like people that I've been on their email list for a long time that I'm thinking well I, I could probably you know um, Todd Herman is one Bedros Koulian is another um, even like even sometimes like Grant Cardone who's emailing all the time it, it kind of seems like well it almost might be the kind of team who would who would take on but I the cost of um trying to get down their voice in advance uh, I think is just maybe it's just daunting I just need to get over it and, and, and give it a shot so yeah I mean I think so and again I mean just looking at most of them are going to hire you for like a few test projects anyway you know what I mean, mm-hmm. like, I mean so it's not like you have to like um like you, you know I have the voice but it's not even a sunk cost in it because again this big well client might come back to you and like um you know, and, and be like, hey, I've been super busy. Sorry, but like this converted great. We finally tested it. What can I do? Can I put you on a retainer? We'll pay you $10,000 a month or, you know, like, you know, like all that, that stuff can still just happen out of the blue. You know what I mean? That's um, true. So it's like not like a sunk cost. This is like a delayed, for now, for now, it's a delayed hour. And if they come back, I'm like, I don't want to work with you. I'm too busy. Like, all right, then I guess it was a sunk cost. Well, even then, sure. something got better. But um, I just sort of think, uh, yeah, I, I, like in, you know, I guess it also depends on like the kind of clients you, you want to work with, but it's, it's like getting the voice right for all of them like that. Are you overcomplicating it sometimes when you could just write copy for people? Like, I don't know, like I write for, like, how long does it really take you to get their voice right? Yeah, exactly. Well, and, and I think that it, it, sometimes I read the emails for, for one or another guy and I'm like, that's like, okay, you know, but it, 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 there's a certain, uh, I feel like if it's good email copy, it's all got the same kind of feel to it. It's conversational. It's got like a attention grabbing headline. It's, it's the zebra email, right? Mm-hmm. And so if you can write a zebra email for one person, writing it for another is not going to be that different. And if they come back and say, hey, I wouldn't say the word bro or whatever, that's that's like a tiny change. So yeah, you're right. Yeah. 
Awesome. Cool. Well, hopefully that cool. helps. Hey, hey thanks that, a lot, man. Can I add something to that? Please. For sure. So uh, I'm I'm like rereading your question again. And one thing I'm all, like I'm seeing is you're phrasing, I'm worried I'll end up over promising under delivering. Uh, me personally, I well, I don't really do much freelancing anymore, but when I did freelancing, um, I would always, always, always have three to five deals in my back pocket, like just in conversation, just because you're talking to somebody about working together doesn't mean you have to do it right away. And bonus points, because now you have a quote unquote waiting list, say, Hey, I'm really booked up right now. I'm free next month. And now you have more prestige. Right. Now, so, do, I guess you only really need to bring that up if, if they ask how soon you can do something. Otherwise, you can wait until they're like, oh, hey, I really want you to do something. I really want to work together and say, all right, well, hey, I'm available in. Or, or would you put that out there earlier on in the conversation? No, just talk about working together and then say, hey, so when, when can we do this? And then you go, oh, actually, I'm, well, you know. Yep. I wouldn't overthink sure. that. Just focus, focus on delivering value. Focus on, um, you know, putting those, uh, What's the expression? Irons in the oven? Is that what it is? Irons in the fire, yeah. Exactly. Stick a bunch of irons in the fire because some of them aren't going to turn into swords. Some are just going to be a lump of steel. Exactly. So start putting the irons in the fire, dude. Um, make sure you, I, you got a three to five <clears throat> in your back pocket at any time. And because um, that gives you the power, right? It gives you the power to say no. Because if you come across some deals, like, so if it says here, like, you're worried about over promising on delivering, um, you don't have to say yes to every single client. Mm -hmm. And I know that, I mean, like, I'm not sure exactly what your situation is, but um, it's definitely a shift in mindset of saying, oh, I can actually say no to a client that I don't want to work with because I don't want to do that project. That's crazy. Um, yep. So, yeah, I hope that helps. It does. Good points. Hey, thanks, guys. You got Absolutely. it. Sweet. Rapid yeah. fire, last five minutes? Let's do that. All right. I'm about it from Danny. I'm about to write my first real estate investing letter. Any tips or idea on how to create a great attention grabbing lead? Also any idea for Facebook ads on it? Um, I mean, I think, you know, story leads and contrarian stuff, like, you know, sort of like, I think like real estate investing is sort of a hot niche right now. And there's a lot of people with like real estate investing offers and masterminds and things like that. So you know, I, I think a story lead always, always works of sort of like the, you know, I was like down and out and like, you know, the country song, the country song lead, right? Like, you know, my wife left me, my truck broke down, my dog got, you know, run over by a train, blah, blah, blah. But then, you know, um, I discovered this sort of like, you know, secret um, to like real estate investing. Cause like, you know, I mean, I've been trying to do real estate investing, but I know that was working. And then, you know, my life sucked. And then I uncovered like the simple breakthrough, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I think another idea might be like a good contrarian angle, like something about why, you know, why 99% of real estate, like, uh, investing, you know, like what 99% of real estate investors like get wrong or like what, you know, 99% of real estate investing courses will never teach you or like the one, the one secret that you can't learn. I mean, just something kind of like how, like that differentiates you from what everybody else is doing. Something curiosity based, um, and contrarian. It's probably my, my gut. Yeah, I think you want to add to that, Ed? No. Yeah. I got, I got nothing for you after that one. That was, that was solid. Cool. All right. Here's a question for me, apparently. Hi, Ed, from Sean Yee. Hi, Ed, trying to craft some offers and niches that are not considered super PC on Facebook, such as diet items and relationship courses. Do you have any tips? Because it keeps getting banned. Uh, that's a huge can of worms. Uh, <laughs> um, I definitely recommend... Stephanie, are you cool if I plug my email list? Because I talk about that type of stuff all the time. Cool. Uh, you can go to edray.com. So E-D-R-E-A-Y.com. Uh, I talk about a lot of Facebook compliance stuff amongst other things and tell funny stories and talk about random shit, which I think you'd find very interesting. Um, but overall, unless... <laughs> yeah, not to be confused. Yeah, thanks, Stefan. Um, <clears throat> gross. No, it's not, it's not ed.com. God damn it, Stephen. <laughs> edray.com. E-D-R-E-A-Y.com. I'll say it again. E-D-R-E-A-Y.com. Uh, I definitely suggest um, being 
first of all, seeing what other people are able to market. That's one thing for sure. Uh, Cause you can market diet items and relationship courses. I've seen a lot of people do it, not a problem. It's more so how you do it. One important takeaway is it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Uh, so yeah, that's that. Sweet. Uh, what's, uh, you want to do one more? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to get as many I know we're up against it, but. Sure. From uh, Sapanta, what's a, de what's a definite way to 100% validate an offer that you're slapping up? That you're what up, slapping up? Yeah, I guess putting together. Right. Yeah, yeah. How do you 100% validate it? I mean, yeah, yeah. can you 100% validate it? But you can, if you're already putting the offer together, oh, fuck. I mean, that's like, it's kind of a little question. I'm trying to think about how the best way to answer that. Um, I think selling it before you fulfill. That's what they usually, that's like the standard is like, I mean, not about it, but like, yeah, sort of like create like a landing page for it and like run ads to it and see when people like click that to cart button, basically. That's like the, the, the classic kind of response, which makes sense. Um, I mean, it's probably the, the, the best way. Because if people were like reading the copy and clicking that to cart button on it and like, they, like, they would buy it, you know, then you kind of know like, this, this has legs. Uh, follow up question from that person. Would you consider a LinkedIn connection list an email list and would you extract the emails and start an email automation? Is that even legal? I mean, I don't think it's like, you know, well, legal in terms of, eh, eh, eh. it's kind of great, I think. Um, I know people have done that kind of stuff, but I don't, I don't want to give advice on that because I, I, I wouldn't be emailing people unless they ask for it. Don't get fucked by GDPR. That's every time I get emails from people who I didn't opt into their list, I just hate them immediately. Yeah. It so. happens like once every month or like once a month, like somebody just starts emailing me if they're like new. Even the content's not bad. I'm like, just like, let me like F this person. You know what I mean? So I don't know. I think there's better, better ways to get in contact with people than that. For sure. Funny, funny story. Um, I think when I was in grade six or something, uh, there was this girl who used to bully me because I was fat and I had man boobs and she said I had custard tits. Anyway, that was a really sad time for me. Um, and uh, so I went to all the freaking um, spam websites and stuff and put in her email. Yeah. <laughs> So she had, so she was subscribed to like 30 to 50 different, just like random mailing lists and um, like porn sites and stuff. It was hilarious. That's, that's a little vindictive, but also funny. Yeah, Laura did that. We were, she was at Target in Vegas like a year ago and some guy was like staring at her getting out of the car and like left a note on the windshield that was like, you know, just like, hey, like looking for a, you know, good time. Like, wow, it's a super sleazy note and like left her phone number. And so she was saying, we went and we went and did like a bunch of like lead gen stuff where it's like, you know, I'm looking for like a, like a, like a mortgage or like I'm looking to go back to college or just all that kind of stuff. And I'm just like fucking put the guy's phone number and like all of those who's like, we just, we just got blown up with um, people cold calling, think, you know, offer him like chances to go to online college or like how to like, you know, get a loan or a mortgage or stuff like that. So it's kind of fun. Savage. Yeah. Um, yeah, I saw David about Adam uh, Alan Forrest. So no worries. I appreciate you checking. Um, dude, come on, two more, two more, real quick. Are we gonna right, yeah, there's only two in the Q and A. We can do them fast. Come on, we can do it. All right, Chad Ballman. I came, I came for the, yeah, I came for the hardcore nudity, but say for the Q and A question. What literature would you recommend or direction would you give to someone brainstorming an offer? I know it must meet certain lifestyle criteria. I mean, it kind of depends on the offer, though. Are we talking like what you know? What niche or category are we talking about? Like, you know what I mean? Okay, uh, I can throw to get a little something second go for it all right uh number one thing is what do you want your life to look like that's the number one question that's the only thing you got to think about really um in terms of at least how to get started with it it's who do you want to serve who are you passionate about helping what skills do you have that you can offer and what information do you know that other people need um and what like how much work and effort do you want to put into this like most people go Oh, like, you know, I want to work, you know, 20 hours a week. It's like, okay, cool. But what kind of work do you want to do? Do you want to be coaching people? Do you want to be um, just doing straight up sales? You know, so if you want to do straight up sales, then you would probably have a recorded high ticket program and you just get on the phone and, you know, uh, enroll people in your program. Or, you know, if you're, if you love writing, maybe you do a newsletter or if you um, like, writing but hate deadlines and 
consistency like yours truly, uh, maybe do books and then you just launch them whenever. Or maybe you're like me as well and you really enjoy being on video and camera and being a performer in a variety of different ways, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, say no more. Uh, <laughs> uh, then you do, you know, video trainings. That's what I do. All my programs are launched. Well, I have one is, is launched via video training. I record it and I sell the recordings. Right. So that's really um, something to look at. Hope that helps. Sweet. What's our last one here? Um, well, we got two. Okay. Uh, so you got me thinking from James, what's the best way to get into the spiritual niche of copywriting and marketing? Uh, and how's the exchange of energy there? Meaning how much does it pay? Um, yeah, spiritual niche is pretty good. Um, I, you know, the best way would probably be the same as everything else. So like, I'd, I'd kind of, I mean, obviously like going to events and things like that, but like that's hard right now, but you know, getting on those types of lists, like emailing the the owners of the different offers kind of sharing like your you know giving them some copy like for free that you wrote for them and being like you know feel free to test it and if that goes well i'd love to work with you more um it is a mediocre market as far as how much it pays there's a lot of people who are really into like the spiritual stuff or like law of attraction or like new age manifestation who don't actually manifest all that much money <laughs> you know i was gonna say these are most of the time, like from my experience, this is like people who like want to feel better about themselves. Like, oh, money means nothing. Money is just paper, but it's like they're living in a shack. There's also a lot of like, broke ass psychics where you're like, ah, you know, you're a psychic, but you, you know, can't use your intuitive powers to make money. Um, so, I, you know, it's like, but that I do know people who carve it out there, but you're just going to find, I, I feel like every time I hear somebody in that niche, they're like, yeah, they said that I, you know, I wrote this for them. And then like, you know, if it does well, they'll give me some money. So like, they're, like, they're trying to get like, these performance skills. Like they, you know, I mean, think about it. Like if you want to be like, who are the top health people? I'm like, here's a ton of people. Here's the top financial. Here's a bunch of people. Who are the top survivor? Here's a bunch of people. Who are the top like uh, biz off? Here's a bunch of people. You know, who are the top, like, oh, here's a bunch of people. Who are the top spiritual? Like, I don't know. So it's like not as big of a niche, right? Like it's not, like there's, you know, numerologists or whatever, um, like, you know, that sort of spiritual. Um, mm -hmm. There's stuff like the secret obviously did quite well, but, but, I'm not saying you can't write in that niche, especially if you're passionate about it. Um, but it's not like a massive, like super lucrative niche. I mean, you really have to, we'll have to probably go through a lot of BS clients to find a couple of good ones. I will, I will counter and say that as, you know, from personal experience, if you go with the spirituality niche and say you dive into, um, let's say, you know, middle-aged execs and corporate people who have lost meaning in their life and are burnt out and hate themselves, uh, that's a good issue after. Yeah, I mean, if you're creating an offer, that's different. But if you're trying to write for clients, I mean, I just think that as far as clients go, there's like a ton of like, like whale clients in the spiritual niche. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you can and you can definitely, I think you can probably find people in the spirituality niche. Um, like, I like I know personally, like if if there was like a, a solid spirituality thing where like they take you. Um, actually, one of my buddies was telling me that there's this like guided. Um, basically it's like a week long and you take like four or five different types of uh, plant medicines, AKA like, you know, like ayahuasca and uh, psilocybin, et cetera. And you take four or five of them over the course of a week. And there's like 5k or something like that to do that. So like there is money in it, but it's very, very niche. And it would probably be in the higher ticket rather than in the low ticket stuff. Yeah. hundred um, percent. Okay. Let's go to the last, what was the last question? All right. From Elizabeth, are paradoxical questions the same as fascinations? No. I mean, they could be, but a paradoxical question's purpose is to open the prospect's mind and shift like a paradigm so that they're more willing to accept um, either the unique mechanism of the problem or the unique mechanism of the solution. So like, for example, when I, you know, I'm doing like a carnivore offer right now and it's like, if fruit, you know, if veggies are so good for us, why do all, almost all kids hate them and we have to force them to eat them? And you're like, oh, yeah, that's true, right? Why are so many poisons made from plants, but very few poisons made from animals? Like, yeah, oh, yeah, why is that true? Like, oh, it's because plants are like actually secretly like toxic and we weren't meant to eat most, most of them and we should really be eating meat. So you can use the paradoxical question there and then, um, like it sets up sort of the unique mechanism behind like the problem. And it also, you know, then can lead to the unique mechanism behind the solution. 
Uh, so that's what the paradoxical question is really good for. It's not similar to the fascination question. A fascination question, Elizabeth, would be like, um, you know, you're going to discover like the like uh, the three reasons why you should never eat carrots. Uh, if you you should never combine carrots and chicken if you want to have good digestion. Um, you know, it could be like how you'll see how three common grocery store uh, produce items, which you probably have in your refrigerator right now, could be the real reason behind your bloating, fatigue, and foggy brain. Um, you know, like the three things to never, they're more like, they're more of uh, like almost like statements versus questions. I guess that's one of the biggest parts of it. The paradoxical question is like asking the reader to consider something and then opening their mind so that then they will be more open to like our solution. Um, so again, it was, I, I would she put in the chat, where would you put the paradoxical questions? So again, I would, I would generally put those going to the mechanism. So going back to that carnivore example, it's sort of like if I, the spokesperson has just heard about how, um, you know, they shouldn't eat vegetables. They'd be like, you know, well, like that seemed like hard to believe because you know, I've always thought veggies were good for me. But then I did think about it. I thought about how it is weird how we have to force kids to eat vegetables because they never want to. And, you know, could it be that, you know, this doctor was right and what he was telling me about, um, you know, vegetables, like actually was making sense. We were really, you know, why are so it like that? Um, you could also do it after the mechanism where you explain the mechanism of the problem and same thing though, like sort of like, oh, like it made sense, but I was still kind of like skeptical, but then I thought about it and then like ask a paradoxical question, right? That gets somebody's like uh, mind. Every now and then you can use a paradoxical question in the lead, but that's sort of advanced. And frankly, I, I just don't think that that's most of the time, 80, 20 in it, you just do it to set up the mechanism of the problem and the solution. So there you go. Sweet, Ed Ray, we did it. I, you know, I had, we had some bumps in the road here, the bumps in the road to a billion, um, some disconnections, some Wi-Fi problems, but you know, we made it through. We made it, there we go. Thanks for, uh, for covering and talking about astral projection while I was gone. Hey man, you got it. Yo, people were asking if I, if I can do like a, a Q&A, like an open call thing. I think I might do that at some point. Be cool. Yeah, do it. I'll also just totally give you a Thursday because we have road to a billion of Ed Ray if you ever want to do that. <laughs> So you, can do that. you figure it out. I'd be, I would be down for that actually. I mean, I'm down. I mean, I love doing the show, but at the same time, it would be fun to just have like a Ed Ray takeover, you know? I'm cool with that. We could talk, we could talk about literally anything. I mean, Hey man, if you want to schedule that in, I'm cool with that. I mean, I'm, I'm here every week. So you let me know and I'm, we'll, we'll do it. <laughs> we could yeah. do Facebook compliance, projection, actual projection, dating, attraction, psychology, sex, uh, kombucha you know all the good stuff in life <laughs> yeah, we can totally do that i um i'm down i i feel like i'm trying to figure out like i think like my road to billions got taken off my calendar for some reason but um Here. who knows what that is but yeah i mean we've got some open weeks coming up we'll talk about it so anyway thank you everybody so much thank you for listening to the road to a billion if you listen to this on itunes make sure you subscribe if you are uh watching the replay on youtube Make sure you're subscribed to my channel and that you hit like and that you comment and tell us, you know, what you enjoyed. And um, other than that, we're going to see everybody next week. Thank you so much, everybody.